So um, again, as Dr. Levy said, it is unfortunate that we're not here in person to have dinner with Frank, but I think we will make up for that the next time he's down here in South Florida. Uh, I've known Frank for a number of years now. Frank Phillips in the world of orthopedics, uh, he really is a true leader in the spine world. And I wanted the fellows and residents to hear his talk because it's interesting that, you know, we as neurosurgeons always think about how much we've innovated. But somehow Frank always end up, ends up, unlike me, on the right side of history in terms of spinal innovations. And hopefully he can share some of his wisdom as to how he's done that over the years. I'm not going to recite his biography for you like all of our visiting professors. He's absolutely accomplished. He's been president and leader of uh, just about every major organization except for, except for maybe AAOS now. Um, and Frank has really um, been a wonderful friend. And I, I encourage you to get to know him because the way he thinks about the spine is unique and is not the kind of thing you find in textbooks. So Frank, uh, with that, please take it away. Thank you, Mike, and a uh, kind introduction. It was great to be here with you. As uh, Dr. Wang said, we've been trying to put this together for a couple of years now, but unfortunately, uh, obviously COVID got in the way. So. I'd much rather be heading to the beach this afternoon, but I'm uh, stuck in rainy Chicago at 6 a.m. doing the talk. So, you know, the genesis of this talk a number of years ago, I had a friend who was a business professor and we were doing a study together. He was in the business school, actually ended up at Duke. And, uh, you know, he said, why don't I, you know, you do the spine stuff and I teach a class in medical innovation when you give a talk. So I sort of, sort of thought that sounded interesting. I'd been interested in it. And uh, anyway, it ended up being a talk I gave to the business students that, uh, you know, sort of evolved into the talk I'm going to give today. And I've always been sort of interested in innovation. And there's probably in medical device over the last decade or two, there's not an area where we've probably seen more innovation or some attempts at innovation than we have in spine care. So I thought I'd just give you some of my thoughts, insights. I don't, most of this is meant to be thought provoking. You know, I couldn't see a lot of x-rays and a lot of screws in the spine, but uh, hopefully we'll get your creative juices going as you go ahead in your career for the uh, residents and fellows. Uh, none of my disclosures really have any direct relevance to the talk today. So, you know, when I think about innovation, it's really uh, what is innovation. It's not a, about an ideal concept in a vacuum. It's about addressing a specific or uh, a st specific need or a defined problem in a novel way with a potential to add and capture value. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. And the importance of value or interest in innovation depends on not only the innovation, but a number of external factors. It depends on the ubiquity or rareness of the problem. So the innovation around, for example, cell phones that are everywhere versus spinal implants that a tiny, tiny percent of the population ever need have different uh, upsides, different uh, uh, pathways towards innovation. It depends uh, on the intellectual property environment, how rigid that is, how protected your innovation might or not might not be. And like everything, in innovation requires money. So it depends about the uh, appetite of investors or if it's your own money, your appetite to fund the investment. And that depends on the potential upside time to market, are you going to sit around for 10 years or you need money back quicker, the competitive of the innovation barriers to entry, uh, which are often unique in medicine. Um, hang on, that's interesting. So when you think about it, historically, our ancestors lived in zero sum societies and success essentially meant seizing something from others, sort of the eat what you kill mentality and that rare, rarely created value. Um, the technology era is sort of the time, I think, when innovation started, which is often attributed to the steam engine um, to current times. And the, the uh, innovation from that point on created and captured value. And as a result, we all inherited a richer society than previous generations had. So when you think about innovation in medicine, getting a little more specific, when you think the first half of the 20th century, most innovation was around serendipity, we'll touch on that. The second half of the 20th century was brute force computing, really. It was driven by pharmaceutical companies looking for that elusive blockbuster billion dollar drug. 
The 21st century has been more about personalized medicine that's largely genome driven. So when we think about it, serendipity, you know, the classic story of Alexander Fleming when he had his petri dish with staff left open by a window, saw a, a fungus came in, formed the mold around the fungus where there was, a, formed a zone around the fungus where there was no bacterial growth, isolated the uh, that to penicillin. And here we have an innovation that really changed the face of medicine in the world that was discovered uh, completely by serendipity. Um, happens less and less, but we have examples in spine where in uh, the late 1990s, neural monitoring existed. We already had tubular-based MIS sort of developed, and everybody knew there was a retroperitoneal uh, approach, and it sort of got put together in a serendipitous way and resulted in the uh, exla for lateral fusion procedure that's now commonly performed. Uh, as I said, the second half of the 20th century is brute force computing. So pharmaceutical companies, they screened large libraries of chemical compounds. They screened, they tested till they hit the blockbuster uh, drug, which is very lucrative, but obviously very expensive, very inefficient, and a very lengthy time period to develop the finished product. And we sort of have an example of that in spine with the development again towards the uh, end of the 20th century with Infuse where they figured out the right molecules, did a lot of work, and we ended up with a product that uh, became mainstream in the spine world. Finally, uh, the, uh, we transitioned in the 21st century, which is more about precision medical medicine, which was largely led by the human genome being characterized in 2000, and the idea that personalized medicine with a whole genome sequence data will be important to predict disease and guide therapies. And there's a lot of effort, not necessarily in our field, in, in surgical field, where gene sequencing is used to pinpoint variants that predispose to specific responses to therapy. And in the chemotherapy world, there are examples of drugs that work 100% of the time on certain cancers if people have a certain uh, genetic marker. So outside of spine that's gone a long way but you know the question is are some of these principles of where medicine's going applicable to spine and Leroy Hood came up with the four p's of medicine of the 21st century personalized predictive preventive and participatory and I think you know those are things to think about as we uh, think about innovation in spine um so what does that mean, personalized spine? I mean, there's the future right there on the floor, recent picture of your fearless leader uh, on a Saturday night in Miami. Uh, and uh, the future sort of perhaps in spine genomics, functional imaging, predictive analytics, which we already see in big data. And all of those allow us to get into specificity about treating patients with spinal disorder in a much more uh, personalized way. So the qu first question is obviously, do we need innovation in spine? And there I have a slide, uh, Dr. Wang was kind enough to forward this case he did last week to me. Um, just kidding, Mike, which I think has uh, just about every <laughs> spine device developed in the last 20 years in this poor patient and probably a terrible outcome. So do we need innovation? We're not that great. We still have unpredictable outcomes, lots of complications. We're still troubled by diagnosis. You know, what is the source of low back pain? I mean, it's hard to imagine that we really struggle to figure this out many times. In fact, most of the time, we typically have disagreement on the best treatment. Um, and we have cr crude surgical solutions, sort of a caveman approach, one size fits all. It hurts, let's fuse it, is sort of the philosophy. And surgical techniques and skills vary very widely, which usually means we haven't found the right answer. So, you know, we clearly need to innovate in, in spine and I challenge you, can we apply those four Ps uh, that I mentioned to spine care? So, you know, this is a great book, Peter Thiel, who's one of the PayPal founders. He became a little bit unpopular when he sort of was in the Trump camp, but he wrote a book called Zero to One, which for any of you, it's a quick, like two day read is one of the best books on innovation I've read. And he says, in a world that's changing so quickly, the biggest risk is you cannot take any risk. So, you know, I think that sums uh, how we should think about innovation in spine. So, you know, others argue there's a lot of innovation in spine. I would contend 
it's easier to define what innovation in spine is not. So it's not product line experience extensions with big announcement every year at, for example, NAS, right? Where every company comes out with an extra thread on a screw or they got a little something on their plate uh, that's really not innovative. And there's a big announcement, this company has 12 new products at NAS. That's not really innovation. It's also not uh, cool overhyped technologies without demonstrated benefit. And we've seen many examples of these ideas. For a while, flexible rods were popular, uh, translating plates in a spinous device. And some of the many of these were sort of seemed like a cool idea, but didn't really pan out as truly innovative. We have examples today, the buzzwords today, 3D printed, which I would contend is just a manufacturing technique. It's not really an innovative product, although the companies, then there are many that promote these uh, marketing market as some type of innovative product, expandable custom cages, endoscopic, um, or the, it is uh, innovation, arguably, whether it's innovative or not, driven by Wall Street without clear cut value. And we see robotics, we've yet to prove they add any value to what we do, but Wall Street loves them and rewards the companies that have them, um, driving, quote, innovation, whether whereas too many surgeons not clear cut they actually add value at this stage. Same with stem cells, AI, machine learning, all the big buzzwords of modern day uh, spine care, but uh, questionable whether those are truly innovative or truly add value. And, you know, often it's not about to have the flashiest thing in the room, as you'll see in this video. So it's not always about the uh, flashy, shiny object. Uh, often that's not the right answer. And, you know, we look at robotics and this slide sort of captures, it captures it. Are we solving a problem or just driving shareholder value with robotics? And here you see we have these very complicated robots that take up three quarters of the OR, add extra time, see arm spins. Um, you know, and uh, what we really just want is to put in a couple of screws. So is that truly innovation or not? I guess uh, time will tell. And I'm not knocking robots. I think it's the first step in the right direction. But, you know, you've got to think carefully about what innovation really is and what uh, the uh, motives and incentives are behind so-called innovation. So... I think what innovation should be is uh, to improve treatment of conditions currently treated poorly. It should enhance outcome, safety, efficiency, and predictability, and add value to the patient. Most importantly, at the end of the day, innovation has to be focused on the patient to really have sustained value versus focused on short-term uh, uh, short market trends or what Wall Street loves this minute. Um, so let's look outside spine a little bit as we talk through what innovation is or could be and use examples in a world that's truly seen remarkable innovation over the last 20 years. So, you know, when you think about it, there's incremental innovation, which is typically what we see in the spine world where uh, the so-called innovation takes away chunks of competitors' piece of the pie. So it's sort of eats away at the existing market and it's somewhat incrementally better than what's out there and it's considered innovation. True innovation is to own the whole pie. So it's really the holy grail, which would be a killer product that allows you to own the whole pie. And you have the example of Amazon, you know, that started off with incremental innovation, you know, how we uh, buy, how we buy and sell and read books. Um, and ultimately uh, became true innovation where it owns that whole pie and, uh, innovate, and it's obviously reflected in the value of Amazon, both to society and in terms of its uh, financial value as a company. 
And I come applying this to the spine world that would allow you to treat previously untreatable or poorly treated conditions would be true innovation. The other concept to think about is creative creation versus innovation. So innovation or even disruptive innovation is just a superior product displaces an existing one. And there are many examples of that inside and outside of the spine world. Whereas non-disruptive creation is not just making a better product, it's solving a, a, or identifying a new problem and creating a new opportunity. And this slide's a little old, but the classic example is Viagra, which not, not only so, solved, not only created a drug, but it solved a problem that hadn't really been identified or talked about. Um, sorry, Mike. Um, and created a multi-billion dollar market. So that would be considered creation. We created a paradigm that changed the way we think, as well as just providing, as well as uh, providing a solution to that problem. Uh, one of the important concepts around innovation that I think really applies to what we do is to simplify. And you have sort of the Tesla example. We have uh, internal combustion engine. Typically, the drivetrain contains 2,000 moving parts. The electric drivetrain, like Tesla, contains 20. And uh, as Tony Serv, as a Stanford lecturer, said, all things equal, a system with few, fewer moving parts will be more reliable than a system with more. And when you apply this to spine in terms of simplifying, as well as to technology in general, what you'd really want to do is transfer a technologic problem from something that requires extensive training, intuition, and iteration, i.e. spine residency, to a problem that can be addressed in a predictable, reproducible, rules-based approach. So that's really, I think, an important concept. Sometimes we tend to make things over-complicated, and especially in spine, we want a relatively simple, reproducible solution, simple enough that every spine surgeon, whether they trained in Miami or Chicago, or practice in Miami or in rural America, can do the surgery with a procedure in a predictable, reproducible way and achieve the same outcomes for our patients. So why is there so little disruptive innovation or creation using the terms I just talked about in spine? The field is just too com comfortable the way it is, so change is resisted. Uh, it's very comfortable spine. Too many stakeholders do too well financially in the current existing uh, system. You think about how well we as physicians ultimately do, the spine manufacturers are doing great, hospitals generally do very well. So there's a little incentive really to look for creation or disruptive innovation when you're doing great. Um, and you know we're wired to protect our beliefs often rather than to look for the truth. So. You know, there's not a huge incentive, even though people pay lip service, to really change the way we do business. Um, and I think at the moment, there's not a huge incentive to alter the status quo. And uh, I think as long as uh, pedicle screws remain the, uh, quote, currency of spine surgery, which, as we all know, are very generic products, we remain stuck. And, you know, every time over the years I've dealt with many big and small companies, they're all terrified some new creative phenomenal idea or can it quote cannibalize pedicle screw business, which they make a fortune off of. So there's that mentality, which I think uh, uh, limits sort of the incentive and the desire to innovate. Um, and other part is often in the spine world, it's a small field with only a certain number of people that have expertise. So as a result, you know, we see the guy who used to be the vice president of sales at company X becomes the CEO of company Y. So we're not really bringing out of the box thing because like you've seen in the tech world, we kind of retread insiders with the same views, the same ideas, the same business models through Spine. So just thinking about Spine, and I've been fortunate, as Mike said, I've been involved in a lot of innovations uh, over the last 25 years, going back to MIS spine back in the late 90s when sort of tubular surgery was introduced by uh, mostly Kevin Foley, Mo Smith out of Memphis and Medtronic, and then was on the board of directors of Kaifoplasty when Kaifon uh, was birthed, I guess, and developed that field. And then Exliff, Nuvasiv, I was, I think, the first surgical consultant back in the day, disc replacement augmented reality, supply chain disruption. I've been involved in a number of these companies. And I think uh, over the years, I've learned a fair amount 
about what defines successful innovation, what doesn't, and what the uh, attributes are, I think, that gives the uh, innovative idea a better chance of seeing the light of day as a product that uh, truly adds value in patient care. So I've met a lot of pe great people over the year, years that have been involved in innovation in both big and small startup type companies. Um, you know, I think the hallmarks of successful innovation, innovation or innovators are on the slide of in terms of what I've learned over the years. Any innovation has to meet an unmet need or clinical problem previously unaddressed. I mean, see all the time people come up with a really cool idea for a really cool widget, but it didn't really solve any problem. And the old technology works just as well. And just because it's new doesn't really make it innovative. It doesn't f solve a problem we all deal with when we're uh, treating patients. Uh, the innovators have to have true belief, passion in the technology. If they are 100% and mostly all about the dollars, my experience is those people fail. If you don't really believe in your technology, it's a long journey and, you know, it's not about the money. And I don't know, all the, all the startup CEOs, if they tell you, uh, you know, invest, all I want is your money. I don't need anything else from you. That's a recipe for failure because uh, it's never just about the dollars. It's about expertise and belief. Uh, you have to be driven by changing the status quo. You can't give in to the doubters you meet along the way. You got to live with uncertainty. It's an uncertain existence if you're putting a lot of money. Companies, big companies, sometimes put hundreds of millions into a product, and if it doesn't make it, the CEO might get fired. Um, so you got to live with that uncertainty. Make peace with not knowing. Uh, you got to assume appropriate degree of risk. And this is a good quote from Edison Schrager, another great book called, called uh, entitled "An Economist Walks Into a Brothel." And the book, she says that measure the risk involved and take only as much as you need in order to get what you need. And I think that's an important uh, reality check if you're involved in any inno inno innovation. And really important is humility. Know what you don't know. So any instead of seeking opinions that confirm with what you already believe, seek out those with which you disagree. Listen with an open mind. I think that's critical. And another great book, Annie Dukes, who was the uh, world poker champion, I uh, wrote great books on decision making, and she says uh, approaching decision in a probabilistic way, getting help from people who offer differing viewpoints, exercise to get ourselves to see decisions from other perspectives, learning the right lessons from outcome. These are all habits of minds that will improve our decision quality, and she applies this in her books to what makes people really good at poker in Vegas. Um, but how, uh, if you read that quote carefully, how apropos is that of what we do in SPY in terms of uh, uh, other people's opinions to improve outcomes. So who, who drives innovation? I think that's important to think about. So generally, the large companies, manufacturers, are, their primary goal is to increase growth profit margins by supporting the demands of current customers, customers whose order uh, support the business. Obviously, that leads to less impetus for disruption if you focus on just servicing the customers with what you have that sort of don't cannibalize the cash cows, i.e. pedicle screw model. So typically, real innovation happens outside of established companies. Um, you know, it's challenging. It's unlike other areas. The uh, regulatory barriers in medicine are obviously in as you all know, much more complex. Um, it's much more difficult, arguably, to innovate in medicine because of many of these barriers uh, than it is in other areas where you can kind of hit and miss and swing and miss, and it doesn't have terrible consequences, and you try again. And part of that is because of this high premium placed on safety. Uh, we have patients at the other end of this innovation, so there's almost zero tolerance of mistakes. Right, if your latest model iPhone has glitches and it sucks, nobody really cares. They do an update of the software, or you trade in your phone, you get the fixed version. Well, it's hard to sort of trade in a patient whose life you may have made more difficult by an innovation that didn't work. So, with this high premium on safety in medicine, that leads to a high price and a long time to innovate. Not everyone has that appetite. We also have the unique sort of environment in medicine that's in some ways a barrier where payment and reimbursement are challenging and disconnected. And when you think about it, it completely defies 
any make any free market economic principle we have this huge disconnect between the seller of the innovative product who's this manufacturer the buyer who's the hospital the pays insurance company and the consumer is a patient who has the least amount of say in what we buy and the surgeon makes all these decisions so it's sort of completely perverted where typically the uh, seller has to uh, please the consumer and business gets done we have this sort of dissociated model that makes it uh, very challenging in terms of payment and reimbursement in medicine. The other regulatory barrier is the FDA, which has improved dramatically over the last 10 years, but it's still a very challenging prospect for innovation to get through an FDA. This is an old study now, I can't believe it's 10 years old, so you can imagine the numbers today. But uh, even then, to take a product through a 510k, which is an easy the easy quote easy path it's like you show you similar to a pre-existing product often co typically costs 31 million dollars with 24 million of that spent on fda dependent related expenses if you're going to do a full pma which is what you need to bring a truly innovative product to market so as you'll know a number of cervical discs to the fda ide pma studies back in uh, 2010 that cost 94 million on average with about 75 million spent on FDA dependent aspects. So you can imagine to do something truly innovative um, is very expensive. It can often will take more than $100 million. So you have to um, really be convinced uh, that it's worth taking the risk and your investors do to go that path with innovation. And the other thing is it's not only expensive, but in orthopedics and spine, it's very time consuming. And this is obviously a busy slide, but if you look at the box, uh, or actually the difference, the, I don't know, third last line that says difference between orthopedics dash spine and other specialties, um, you can see the length of uh, days from, uh, of the pivotal trial, the length of FDA reviews, pivotal trial to start days, uh, enrollment, etc. All of those numbers for spine orthopedic devices are almost 200% longer than in other specialties. And uh, obviously that a lot has to do with the uh, sort of risk averse behavior of the FDI. And there's little incentive to approve anything, right? You can't really uh, look good, but if it doesn't work, you look really bad. So it's that environment where people's job depend on not failing. So there's le less incentive to approve products that maybe there's a chance it could harm patients. So, you know, you, you're faced with a medical challenge, regulatory challenge with innovations, very expensive, very time consuming. But I would contend without innovation, it's sort of a race to the bottom, right? And you have perfect competition, which is the ideal situation where equilibrium is realized when supply meets demand. That's sort of the uh, perfect free market economic storm. So what does that mean? Uh, you have a lot of undifferentiated product, the market sets a price, new firms enter because it's lucrative, which drives down prices and eliminate, eliminates profits that attract to them. And we really see that a lot in spine where we have a lot of generic pro undifferentiated product, the market, which is largely the hospital drives down sets of prices and still lucrative. Some more companies come in with a lot of promise, but they end up being just another pedicle screw company and we haven't really innovated. And the airline and the analogy, analogy, which is really the sort of commoditized race to the bottom model was in 2012 for a $278 each way airfare. Uh, the airline at that time made 37 cents per passenger. So that's an example of sort of that race to the bottom mentality. So learn, we should learn from tech, right? They build monopolies, really, when you think about it. And these days, that's become contentious in and of its own right. But they own the market. They can set their prices. Most of these companies, as you see their uh, logos on the bottom, are so good at what they do. There's no other close substitute we have. And it's reflected in the value where Google, for example, is worth four times more than every US airline combined. Um, and monopolies do drive progress because of the promise of a sustained monopolies incentive to uh, innovate. And we see, you know, every year innovation comes out of these monopolies to maintain their status as a monopoly. And they create and capture lasting value. Few would argue these companies haven't created 
lasting value. Um, they don't build an undifferentiated commodity business or product. So one of the things we run into in medical device shit all the time is that startup innovation uh, in first mover obsession. You know, you got to be the first. So I'll just say, uh, you know, it's uh, it sort of sounds good, but first mover is a tactic, not really a goal. It doesn't do much good if you're the first mover, but someone comes along and unseats you. So really, when you think about it, you want to be the last mover where you create the, the product or the innovation that's um, so great, you enjoy years of the so-called monopoly product. So it's really about the end game. And uh, here you see in the cartoon, I don't know how well it shows, it says me not worried about design issues, me a first move advantage with the uh, square wheel. So important to remember that, you know, don't, if you're innovating, be totally driven by being the first to market, although the values, remember, it's just a uh, tactic, not a strategic goal. So how do we, uh, when we get into more specific, think about uh, spine innovation. So really our goal using sort of going through the principles of this talk, we want to really get to precision medicine, right? We want to enhance predictability of an outcome for a particular patient at the best cost. I think all would agree that products or services that allow for that and precision medicine would be truly innovative. And so the three pillars of that are one, the surgeon, and arguably uh, the most important role in the, three, in the uh, precision medicine is the uh, diagnosis, patient select selection. Next is the actual surgery or the technology, which you'd want reproducibility, convenience, complication elimination, and really getting back to that simplified model, you really, although it's not cool for all of us on the Zoom that are surgeons, you want to commoditize the surgeon. And we'll talk about that in a second. But you want to create predictable, reproducible, rules-based approaches rather than approaches that depend a lot on surgical, surgeon skill variability. And that's really about the technology to achieve those goals. And then the venue. In today's world, it's not just about the surgeon or the procedure. It's about where we do it. We want lower cost enhanced patient experience. And if we can uh, accomplish those three pillars, we're getting a long way towards precision medicine in the spine. So when we think about uh, the diagnosis and moving to precision medicine, we have to move from intuitive to precision medicine. So when you think about it, uh, Historically, long time ago, it was all intuitive medicine, the so-called art of medicine, right? Where problems were solved by experimentation and pattern recognition. So in other words, you know, like the last uh, 30 patients who came to the ER had a cough and sneeze and had a positive COVID test, we know they've got COVID, right? That's intuitive. Uh, then we moved to empirical medicine, and we've done a very good job of that in spine over the last 20 years. We've amassed massive amount of data that shows the average treatment effects for a specific procedure or the specific widget. Um, but it doesn't tell me how the patient sitting in front of me is going to do, right? So we know an average effect, but I don't know the precision effect for that patient. So precision medicine is where we can predictably treat that one patient um, sitting in front of you, and likely that's going to require AI and big data. And there's been a lot of effort uh, to uh, uh, develop that in spine. Arguably, at this point, a lot of it is confounded by the fact that the data in is often woefully inadequate. So any conclusions we get in terms of effect on a specific patient or precision, precision medicine is currently quite inaccurate. Um, and you can't rely alone on big data, as this quote says, of an increased chance we'll miss something while giving the illusion we know everything. But clearly, AI, big data is going to play an more and more important role in what we do in terms of giving us uh, a, a predictable outcome for an individual patient. And really, the key of that is diagnosis, diagnostics. And diagnostics have been lagged behind in spine as well as in medicine in general because it's traditionally an un unattractive investment. There's often not a ton of money to be made in a, a diagnostic. So there's little innovation in that area. But I think as we move more towards a value world where outcomes become as or more important than the treatment volume, 
um, that there'll be a second look or more emphasis on diagnostics, given that ultimately not only outcomes, but how we're, we're paid will depend on having better outcomes. Um, and there's some look at that in spine starting already. There's molecular testing, you know, is it uh, genes for certain pain, uh, pain uh, biomarkers that determine how you'll do uh, treatments along those lines. Functional imaging, we now have attempts at MRI spectros spectroscopy, looking at painful, perhaps just genomics. Um, I think we'll see some of that. I mean, it's slow over the next few years. When you think about it, diagnostics is a tidy amount of what Medicare, the government pays in terms of their medical budget, yet the cost savings they provide are enormous. I mean, just think about where we'd be if we didn't have a rapid test for COVID or if we didn't have a strep test you can get at Walgreens, how much money they save by diagnosing disease earlier on. Um, and uh, those are the diagnostics are what will allow us to predictably treat a particular patient. The problem is there's little incentive companies, the traditional spine companies, allocate resources to their core competencies, which are widgets, um, not diagnostics. Um, so I think it's going to take a paradigm change where spine companies' core competencies implants instead of developing core competencies in solving challenging spinal disorders. And that's going to combine diagnostics, biologic therapies, as well as just the implants, which has been the currency of spine. And I think we're starting to see that, and you know, in the words of Wayne Gretzky, moving to where the quote pack is going. So I think companies are starting to look at this. They're starting to be look at data collection, AI, uh, things outside diagnostics, things outside of just the widget, because I think they realize they have to be more than just widget companies to be successful in the world going forward. So what about the technology part, the procedural innovation? I think we need to be effective, less invasive, reproducible, safe, patient-friendly, and provide measurable value. And I would contend it's been too focused on the implant. It has to be procedural innovation, delivering the procedure. That term didn't really exist probably five or six years ago. Now it's sort of become the buzzword of every company. It's about not just the widgets, it's about procedural innovation. They say the words um, and sort of become in vogue, but very, when you think about it, very few times are they really focused on the procedural innovation rather than sort of squeezing the most they can out of a particular widget. So, you know, in terms of technology, what's your goal? Your goal as a manufacturer of a spine procedure is to commoditize the surgeon. I know it's not sexy and surgeons don't want to hear it, but if you're a patient, that's really what you want. And the example is 25 years ago, there weren't that many surgeons that could do hip replacement, knee replacement, or spine fusion. It was done in academic centers by a few expert surgeons. Then technologies advanced to the point where they made even average surgeons good. So the implants improved, they became sort of largely foolproof. Like if you look at hip and knee replacements now done by orthopedic surgeries very well in community hospitals, you don't need to go to their university center, the better outcome, fewer complications. The sort of classic example of this is LASIK in your eye, where all the skills for doing LASIK are embedded in the machine, not the doctor, right? I mean, the, you said they do all their fancy computer settings and the computer like literally guides you them through the procedure and it's really eliminates the variability in doctor's individual skill set, which is what you want. See, when you think about it, if you're a patient, you want to get the same exact same good, safe outcome when you have the surgery, you know, in rural Illinois, or you have it at the University of Miami. And that has to do with the technology being the equalizer. And perhaps, you know, some of the things we're seeing develop now, the answer, robotics, image guided, augmented reality. Uh, the, the premise behind them is to take a lot of that variability out of it um, and make all spine surgeons equal, which translates into all patients doing equally well. So I think, you know, when you think about innovation in terms of device and technology, I think having that thought at the back of your mind is useful. It raises some interesting questions, right? But you have a car, self-driven car, which is sort of the medical analogy to a robot. You know, when things go south, who's responsible? Is it the driver or in a self-driving car or is it Tesla that's responsible? Is it the uh, surgeon 
uh, that's responsible when things go south, or is it the robot and the robot manufacturers are responsible? So they it raises a lot of issues in medicine and also limitations. Like nobody's going to ever develop a true robot um, that, by definition, would put in the screw for you in spine because the developer of the robots won't want that liability. They rather want the surgeon on the hook if things go south. As you see in this slide, which was done by one of my partners, is a very experienced, excellent surgeon when the robot didn't work so well. Fortunately, this was easily fixed when he got the fluoro shot, but certainly not an exciting robotic screw picture. The other thing is it's not only about the wedge, it's about the delivery of care. When we think historically all care was given in hospitals where they did everything for everyone. They really, ate, it's hospitals, I would argue, are a model from the 19th century where they were designed to treat rare disease and ill patients. Uh, clearly, hospitals are not the best place to do high volume elective procedure on healthy patients, uh, healthy people. Um, and to be honest, without subsidies, administered prices and regulations that constrain competition, most hospitals wouldn't be uh, uh, economically viable. And hospitals have a very large financial incentive keeping uh, high volume procedures in the hospital to subsidize the unique low volume, expensive, specialized problems that they do have to treat. And at the same time, hospitals obviously have a lot of political clout. But we've seen the deconstruction of hospitals. We have like retail clinics where you can go get a COVID test at Walgreens, freestanding emergency rooms, which are so much more pleasant and convenient than sitting for hours in a hospital ER. We have ASCs, which we'll talk about, which I think are very innovative in terms of delivery of spine care and then even specialty hospitals that are very focused on a particular procedure or test. And uh, we've seen how even though hospitals traditionally are very powerful, the advantages that this deconstruction and this disruption brings in terms of quality cost convenience are so apparent that the fallback strategy of hospitals, which is merging buying practices, imposing regulations through their political clout in DC will all fail. And we've seen that the hospitals are having to rethink how they do it. So I think innovation comes not only in terms of, you know, where we cut the skin, it's also about how we deliver the care we provide. And, uh, you know, ambulatory surgical centers, which uh, um, is sort of an interest of mine, and I do pretty much all my uh, single level fusions, whether it's uh, X-Lift, T-Lift, um, in our ASCs, and these are ASCs that are, do not have 23 hour admission. Uh, patients have to be out at the end of the day and doing single level fusions for probably the last five, six years have had no readmission. So I think, you know, these, fo these are focus factories are optimized to do a focus job very well. And all, many, many studies show that outcomes are often better. Patient satisfaction is high and less costly. And we actually have in Illinois at Blue Cross actually have come up with a plan where not only the facility fee, but they're actually offering or demanding, I guess, uh, if you do the same procedure in a surgery center, the professional fee. So what I get paid for my doing the surgery is 15% more versus 15% less if I do that exact same procedure in the hospital on the professional fee side. So there's a 30 cent, 30% discrepancy in what I get paid for operating based on where I do it because, you know, the payers see the incentive financial of getting these cases out of expensive hospitals. So if we're going to do more and more of uh, surgery in the ASC, um, you have to do complex things by surgeons that may not be that good at complex things. So you need less disruptive approach. You need procedures and implants tailored to the ASC. So I think spine companies have been reluctant to do this because they don't want to give you a less expensive plate or screw to use in the ASC, which is really required for it to be economically viable in an ASC because it then cannibalizes you know, the, the money they make of screws and plates in hospitals. So what do they do? They fall back on kind of a create quote creative innovation that I could think of in about three minutes as could any of you on the Zoom, or make a peel pack inexpensive plate with a repless model for the ASC. It's not really innovation. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to innovate in terms of procedures in an ASC. And uh, I know you guys, you know, you have uh, Mike who does endoscopic stuff, and maybe that's the answer for the ASC solution for fusion. It's also about post-surgical pain management. 
Um, we don't do awake awake surgery, and we do these all uh, with a with a multimodal program that our guys have been very much involved with since the days of ASC hip and knee replacement. And we send all our patients home after these more complex procedure. So I think there's a chance to innovate in post-surgical pain man management and also in how we deliver it, creative partnerships of stakeholders. So hospitals and surgeons aligning in ASC is the, you know, in going payers are involved in ASC. You know, you have United Healthcare that own bought um, SCA that owns all the surgery centers, maybe manu device manufacturers will play a role in ASCs and partnerships. So there are a lot of ways or innovation, I think we'll see in how the services are provided, which will ultimately allow MIS outpatient techniques to be applied to more and more complex spinal uh, pathologies. And I think, you know, the ASC is sort of the classic uh, case where we sort of saw you know, huge mainframe computers like you see on the bottom left who into kind of clunky uh, desktop to laptop to iPhone. And it's sort of that decentralization model we see as procedures and technologies allow that it's more convenient and it's lower cost solutions. So just the last couple of slides, so some practical tips for you guys. You guys, most of you are residents, fellows, and you're going to go out into the spine world over the next few years, you're going to be excited. You've seen, you've worked with people like uh, your mentors who are incredibly innovative people, you know, Mike, despite downplaying, it's been involved in a ton of innovation in spine, and you want to be just like Mike. So, uh, you know, my practical advice to you guys, um, you know, it's exciting to be involved in innovation. But the front page of the newspaper test remains uh, true. Every time you think you're doing something, if you, it wouldn't look good on the front page of the Miami Herald, it's probably a gut check. You shouldn't do it. You know, industry will come at you fast and furious with opportunities and make it sound like this is your take it or leave it opportunity. If it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. There's no free lunches. You got to provide services that you paid for. That's how guys get in trouble. You all get backers, and every week there's part spine surgeons uh, who are in trouble for getting quote free lunches. You got to get paid for what you do, not for things you don't do. Go slow early in your career. It's when you're most vulnerable. You know, you think you've seen your mentors doing great things, and that's kind of when you're most vulnerable, right? And the companies know that they'll come and try and tie you up and offer you something. Be patient. I guarantee if you do the right thing for your patients and you're a good surgeon, better opportunities will come later. Don't grab that first thing when you're a year in practice. Never sign these all-inclusive deals. Companies love to tie you up. So if you're ever going to do anything with a company, make sure you very specifically define what you're doing. It can't be about like, any comp any, you can't uh, play in any space that's competitive when the space is spine surgery. So define what you do. And remember, don't be arrogant, naive. I see that a lot, right? I mean, guys come out, they're like, I'm a big shot neurosurgeon, spine surgeon, Every the world owes me. Remember, you're not that special. There are lots of us out there and manufacturers ultimate responsibility is their sh to the shareholder to make money. And we're all just tiny cogs in that business to these big, massive billion dollar spine companies. Remember, be fair and cordial in dealing with the industry. People fall down that on all the time. They come out and they're big shot surgeons and they expect everyone they interact to treat them that way. It's a small world. And if you're pissed off people, remember the rep today is going to be the CEO of a company in 15 years. So it's a small world. Uh, treat people fairly. Remember, critical to disclose. Um, it ultimately protect you. There's really no sense in trying to hide this stuff. So disclose to your colleagues, organization, most important to your patients, it will ultimately uh, protect you. So a whole nother talk on how to deal with the industry, but these are just some important bullet, bullet points. Remember, it's all we get involved in innovation and exciting and potentially can make money off it. But if you're not putting the patient first, you're not really doing anything worthwhile. And as I said, if you're, you wouldn't be proud if your mother read it on the, in the newspaper, you shouldn't do it. It's funny. I mean, I've been at this for a while and I think of this probably every few weeks when I was a chief resident, Frank Eismont, close to you all, uh, came as a visiting professor to University of Chicago. And out of everything, I remember he said, never leave the hour until you're proud of what you've done. 
so that's it's funny i've been at it for a while and i literally think of that at least probably every three weeks in the hour you know it's a long day you want to get out of there you got a dinner plans you start looking at the watch you cut corners so never leave the hour until you're proud of what you've done which is my frank eisman quote for the day Remember, don't be a big shot. It's much better to do innovation, make your money, be successful, improve patient lives, and do it quietly. You know, you don't want to be the big poster child, front page news. But sooner or later, if you raise red flags, the government comes calling, you're pretty much done. They have more personnel time and money than you'll ever have. So you don't want to be that guy. So to end off, I think what we're going to see and are seeing in Spine is just changing uh, how we do business. You know, you think we used to have CDs, tape, we transformed to Apple's iPods, iPads. So we changed, the world changed how people purchase, listen, watch, and share music. Uh, we had traditional malls. We now have Amazon changed this whole supply chain innovation in terms of the way we live. We used to have phones and phone books. Now we have Facebook and LinkedIn. So it sort of changed the simplicity and efficiency of our interactions. So I think personalization, simplicity, taking costs out of supply chain, changing how we interact with products and services is what we've seen outside of Spine. And if you think about that, all of those uh, comments are apropos of where we should be heading in terms of Spine innovation. And uh, as a Chinese proverb, uh, maybe too soon to use Chinese proverbs, uh, but the winds of change blow. Some people build windmills and we should all be guys. I uh, build walls and rather we should all be the guys building windmills. So I'll end off there. Sort of, I know it's uh, throwing a lot of random thoughts at you, but the idea is not really to have a, is more to create uh, some thought and excitement and interest in the opportunities you guys all have to make spine better as we go forward. So thanks for listening. And Mike, uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, sticking with me as we've navigated this talk through two years of rescheduling and rescheduling. So I have five, 10 minutes left. I'll open it up for questions, comments. That's fantastic, Frank. Thank you for sharing that with us. There's tremendous wisdom you've offered here. We've hired a number of new young spine surgeons and uh, recruited more. And I think that uh, anybody who has listened to this talk has really uh, heard some very, very wise words. So I want to open it up because uh, there's so much to talk about. You've really covered so much ground in the last 50 minutes. And and again, I mean, I, I have not heard a better talk summarizing um, these really critical points that I think, you know, it's like when your parents don't talk about in money and investing, you know, they're neglecting a huge part of your education. I think we sometimes do that with our residents and fellows. So maybe we can see, see are there any questions? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the whole ability to see who's going to raise their hand. Um, maybe some of our younger attendings will want to ask some questions. Oh, Dr. Levy's going to say something. Go ahead, Ellen. As, as representing one of the younger attendings, uh, <laughs> No, just real quickly, fantastic talk. I know that I, I don't see Ivan Scheidowitz here, but I know he's uh, also a huge fan of yours and we're a, a huge fan of his. Uh, you know, he's a phenomenal IR guy, also taking roots from South Africa. I, I was interested in your ASC perspective because we're kind of really at the very beginning of these discussions. And I just feel like academic ASCs and spine are very different than private ASC and spine, just to give you an example, like we did an 85 year old uh, lady, you know, minimally invasive, but I mean, she's just not someone who we could ever get to an ASC. And then other, you know, ASC patients, 27 year old car accident, normal spine, getting, getting, getting fused. And it's a kind of a per perverse incentive in some ways. And I just wanted to know how, you guys uh, navigated academic ASC, which is really a special uh, problem or special opportunity. Yeah, so I mean, I think you're exactly right. I mean, people say it's quite cherry picking patients, but you know, I would argue it's the right patient for the right venue. I mean, there's no doubt it adds huge economic saving to the system if you do the appropriate patient in the ASC. So. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it depends on your practice, right? I mean, if you've got a practice where you're treating eight, sick 85-year-olds, you know, with surgery, that's not a practice that's going to fly in the ASC. But 
you know, if you look across the country, not only in private practices, but in academic centers, still the bread and butter of what we do is uh, not necessarily all complex surgery unless you focus in that area. So I think, uh, you know, I think as you get, as you do more in ASC, you sort of quote, not really stretch the limits, but you get more comfortable with it. And there's, you know, I'm not doing my 80 year old, you know, TLF in the ASC, obviously, but, you know, I'll do 60 year olds, seven healthy 70 year olds in the ASC. And so I think it depends partly on your practice, but I think uh, at the end of the day, I think it's going there. The challenge that you bring up is absolutely true, right? It's always that tussle, the hospital, if you work, you know, you're at the big academic center, the tussle is always the hospital doesn't want to lose those cases, cases right? They make a ton of money off elective spine in the hospital. So I think it's got to be a partnership. At the same time, it has to be worth your while, right? We've struggled a little with it and we've changed some of our centers we own outside of Rush, some we own with Rush, and the negotiations with the hospital have always been around. It has to be enough incentive for the surgeons because there's a pain to initially to going there, right? Like the first time I did an x lift you know, the surgery center, I was terrified. I'm like, oh my God, if I get a vascular injury, I'm totally screwed or something like that, you know? So you... You, it's it's adds to your uh, coronary stress. So you have to be incentivized to do it. I mean, it's unfortunately true. It's uh, largely driven for the most part by the surgeon's financial incentive. But at the end of the day, it's good for patients. I mean, my patients love it. When you go back and serve it, and I much rather wake up in an AC where people love their job and the recovery nurses are happy and nice versus, you know, wake up in the hospital with a patient next to them is just, you know, and the recovery's had a whipples and is screaming and miserable. Um, so patients love it. But yeah, I mean, you know, but I think ho the hospitals, universities that are forward thinking have been willing because they see it uh, that the, that's the future. So they've been willing to partner with surgeons. You have some leverage, they can't do it without you. So my belief is you've got to figure out a path where you can work with your hospital, with your university in a way that both sides benefit is how I think you've got a position. You're not going to obviously in a university and be able to go alone, but or maybe in different some environments you can. But for the most part, it's going to be a partnership. But I think hospitals are just kind of say we, you know, think we're doing too well on spine. Why would we ever do this? We're going to be short sighted. I see Dr. Basil uh, raising his hand. Yeah. Uh, hey, Dr. Phillips, thank you so much. Um, I'm one of the current chief residents. I'll be going to practice this coming year. Um, and obviously the talk was super, super helpful for me from that perspective. You know, a question I have listening to all this and thinking about, you know, what the next year, five years look like, and certainly in academic spine, putting together the actual clinical volume, working on the research and potentially being involved in industry and things like that. Can you just comment on work-life balance and how you achieve that with all, with all of this together? That's yeah, a, a whole nother talk, right? I mean, that's sort of the challenge we all face. And yeah, it's a huge deal. And, you know, you got to remember, I mean, I think back on myself, I mean, Every time you say yes to something, it's like you're sacrificing, right? It's our lives are sort of zero sum gains in that sense, right? If you take on another responsibility, it means you're going to be an hour late to your kid's soccer game or something. So I think it's it's a it's a huge point, and that we're very bad, especially early on. It's taken me all these years. I've only got better at it now. Is to say no, right? Uh, which is why I say, you know, you don't have to grab every opportunity in your first year in practice. So I think, yeah, it's a, it's sort of the cliche stuff, but it's so true is, you know, like keep it, you know, you got to have life outside of spine. We kind of, as spine surgeons, have a, we're all kind of dysfunctional personalities. I mean, what normal people would do what we do, right? Like every day you stare at the spinal cord and when something bad happens, I have to do this for 25 years. I'm still lying awake in the middle of the night. Like, what did I do wrong? And I got to see the patient the next day. So it's a tough existence. So you got to have a support system. You got to prioritize your family, make time for yourself. I mean, you've heard it all. I mean, obviously burnout, you've all, nowadays, a lot of talks and meetings talk about, and it's all true. I mean, you know, you got to decide, you got to know who you are, right? Like you come out and everyone's seen, you know, like, T2 to the pelvises and like, wow, that's cool. But maybe it's not for you. You know, not everyone has to be that surgeon. You have to know who you are. You have to know what excites you, what's going to make your life better, not just say yes, because it's just another test to do because you feel like you should do it because some of your mentors did it. So I know it's all 
superficial advice and it's a whole nother conversation but like you know make you know you gotta have uh, life outside a spine is the most important thing you know if you have kids go to their sports games be their baseball coach i mean you know make time for your family every day every week all the things that you've heard a million times are really important i've tried to do that as best i can um yeah so i mean that's sort of the two second answer to really what's probably one of the biggest uh, we'll have to we'll have to have you back uh frank to talk about that yeah. one more question from dr shelby burks and then don't forget that the m m zoom link i think is a different link so uh we'll have to tune into a different link but shelby please go ahead Hey, Dr. Phillips, um, Shelby Burks, just starting my practice about maybe my third month in, uh, did my training here at UM. I thought it was interesting, you know, you spoke about the airline industry because every other comparison of the airline industry and medicine is to say that they are the gold standard in safety. So I wonder how much of like a, how mutually exclusive safety and, you know, this innovation is. You did talk about that a lot. I thought that, I just want to say, I thought that was a cool comparison and it's something I want to sort of think about moving forward in, in my talks, but I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, the airlines held up as the uh, safety standard. And I remember a number of years ago when this when safety uh, became a really hot topic and the Institute of Medicine talked about how many people we kill with avoidable errors. We all had like the the hospitals all had like the airline safety guys come in. And I mean, I think there's a lot you can learn from them. I mean, I think the two are sort of separate issues. I mean, that, you know, safety where you have responsibility uh, for people's lives is critical, whether it's doing spine surgery or flying, you know, airplanes. But at the same time, you know, there's that profit motive. I think that has more to do not so much by cutting corners in terms of safety because that's not going to work. It is more about a service attitude, right? So, like, if you don't provide good service on the airline, if you get crappy peanuts and the seat doesn't recline, you're going to look for another airline, right? And it's the same in medicine. If, you know, you don't provide the patient the services and the outcomes they're looking for, even if they assume it's safe, uh, those are the differentiators in terms of services, uh, products, um, and it's sort of the same thing in the airline industries. The industry, everyone does a very good job, I should say, for the most part with safety, but it's the rest of it that sort of makes or that makes them profits or not, and that's the piece you know we have to focus on. And I think the ASC is like for me the classic example as I think about it for that, right? Where you provide it, we think. Of, better, more patient-friendly service. So I think that's a way, a sort of innovation driving a service way.